Hello and welcome to another episode of Casual Friday. We've had the monthly close. We're coming up to Christmas and New Year. I'm here with the duck and we're going to talk about markets and news as well. No surprises, obviously, as to what the news is going to be, given it's been one revolving story, but we'll try to cover some other stuff. First things first, duck, how's life? What's good? What's up? Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot, but um, getting through it, so can't nice. complain too much. I mean, you can. You're you? just choosing not to, right? That's the <laughs> that's the difference between a tough guy like you and all these other people. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm fine. So we've had the monthly close. That's kind of what I started with. Um, massively divergent between Bitcoin and ETH again, as always, as far as that kind of stuff goes. Uh, I mean, even just right off the bat in terms of BTC, the monthly close is a bearish engulfing, like a classic bearish engulfing, the one where it spikes above last month's high. Uh, and then closes below last month's low, which is like, not great. Th there's my amazing technical analysis there. Bearish monthly engulfing, not great. Uh, and then on that same time frame, as we know, in terms of where is the first monthly area of support, it's at 14k. Uh, and the first monthly resistance is, you know, basically the point of breakdown at around 20k or 19k, however you want to frame it. So, I mean, on the monthly, this just like on any other time frame, I'd be just like bearish this, right? Because you have like a break of support uh, and the follow through on that break of support was a bearish engulfing. And you have, you know, the reclaim setup if it's going to happen or the retest setup, whatever, at 19 and the actual candle structure closer to 14. Is there anything on this monthly time frame that's making you think like, think like uh, it looks good or, you know, there's there's some hope. Maybe there's a bit of a wick. What's what's your view on this close? No, I think it's it's pretty much as you said. It's shitty. It's the one that looks like shit. Um, 14k support. Uh, that's a good area to do business at. Uh, if we wick 10k, I mean that'd be nice. Uh, like as in like close around 14k, uh, the monthly wick to 10k. That'd be a good setup. A close above 19k would be a good setup. Right now, you're just basically at least on this time frame, you're kind of gambling a little bit. Uh, you're hoping for it to for this to be a false false range breakup uh, breakdown, right? You want to have this kind of reclaim. Usually you don't want to bet on false anything, right? False breakouts, false breakdowns doesn't really make much sense. Tits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like the, the, the thing is, uh, especially in the bear market, you don't want to bet on false breakdowns, right? In the bull market, you can bet on false breakdowns all you want because that's usually a good setup actually to play. Uh, you just buy when the support breaks and then you usually make money the next or week later in a bear market that's obviously different so given that this is a breakdown um it's pretty hard to fade on the monthly just based on that fact uh and given that the good setups are just a little bit higher or a little bit lower so I agree with you there yeah, I think that's right. Um, we can do the same for ETH, and it presents, I think, quite a different chart, right? So yes. if, if we look at the ETH candle structure, the one here, it's the highest close from last cycle at around 1.1k. And not only did we get another test and close above the level, but the market also spiked the preceding two months of lows and closed above them. Now, granted, oops, that was my Windows key. My bad for the audience. <laughs> it's not, that's not a good sound, I'll say that much. Um, but, you know, it spiked previous month's low into support and closed above it. Uh, and it did, what you know, it did also spike above last month's high. But in terms of the resolution, the important stuff is that it closed above support. And, you know, the breakdown below previous month's low didn't hold either. So on the monthly basis, this is like a completely different chart in my opinion, because, you know, it's not below support, it's at support. Uh, and the attempted stab through the preceding candles low uh, also was kind of unsuccessful within that context. Uh, in terms of monthly levels, that's kind of where I'm having not some difficulty, but uh, I'm, I kind of go back and forth. Like, I I'm open minded and have used in the past the, you know, the basically the last big green candle we had, uh, the close of that on from the, J the July candle as the range high, which comes out yeah. at around 1700 or thereabouts. And then after that, I mean, realistically, you know, what do I have to look at? Two, two, two and a half thousand? <laughs> if we're going to use yeah. the monthly time frame or roughly like something a bit more extreme like that. Uh, but it seems that for the time being where like Bitcoin broke down from its range and ETH is still stuck in its range between 1.1K and like 1.7K basically. And I'm sure you can add a midpoint to that and fuck around and find out. But it's a completely different different chart, right? Yes. I mean, it's it has bullish market structure basically, um, as weird as that sounds. Uh, the monthly... 
honestly, and it's kind of funny when you look at the ETH monthly on, on log scale, right? It just looks like a pretty orderly pullback in a bullish trend um, more than anything, which is insane to say, given it went from 5K to 800. Um, that seems like completely nuts. But just zooming out, it seems kind of like an okay pullback. And given we're not able to break new lows, that's at least a good sign. Um, now, we've had this discussion a lot, like, is it lag? Is it strength? Um, I'm not sure. I'm it not haunts sure me it. every day. <laughs> every yeah, time it's, ETH it's, stays above 1.1k, I'm like, when is it going to rug me, you know? Yeah, it's it's really hard to say. And I, I don't have a de definite answer for it. I think the good kind of play to make is if we close above 1.5k on the monthly on ETH, it just seems like it's going to go and it's probably going to go really hard. Uh, I don't really see any good resistance um, be beyond like 2.3k maybe, um, maybe 2.5 like you said, but I don't, I don't like any of it. I think all of that resistance is kind of shit. So if you get a close above 1.5k, might be go time again. Um, until then, it looks like it's ranging and uh, like a range between 1.1 and uh, I don't know, 1.5 maybe. It's not necessarily something you want to be trading. Um, so it's the same, like it's it's a very different picture, but it's the same approach basically for, for ETH to me at least anyway, uh, as, as to Bitcoin, like Bitcoin and ETH mirror each other in the approach that I think is most sensible, which is basically uh, you either like buy deep, deep supports and for ETH that'd be like 700 um, or you buy a reclaim of the next resistance because um, yeah, uh, then I think it would go hard. With regard, like ETH has, um, if it does reclaim, it has a better structure, right? So maybe it'll outperform if it does reclaim 1.5K. Um, not entirely sure on that, but I think it just makes sense given it's been outperforming the entire bull market. Yeah, that, that seems correct. Uh, I saw someone make this argument, I'm, I'm forgetting who it is now, it might have been Jim, um, that, he, like he, for example, he's very high conviction that, he, that this isn't the low on ETH and that leverage has been washed out basically everywhere else in the ecosystem, except actually ETH and all the kind of staking and yield that's been piled on top of that from its transition uh, and, you know, all the DeFi protocols, to which to some extent are contingent on ETH price, you know, all these Lido type of setups where you have like huge amounts of staking. So for, so for him, in terms of like distressed assets, where there is uh, kind of outright, but also I think the term he uses hidden leverage, uh, ETH has been kind of immune to that and propped up by, by that premise, uh, and that it's very unlikely that it makes it into next cycle without at least testing uh, what's, you know, what, what's what's resting beneath that. I, I guess that's just another articulation of the uh, lead versus lag argument, uh, and that, you know, all these uh, APRs and APYs and uh, kind of protocol, protocol native yield uh, could be defending the market in a kind of artificial way. Uh, do, do, do you subscribe to that? Do you have any views on that? Uh, I kind of, look, I'm not intelligent enough on the fundamentals to actually sit there and research about like kind of hidden leverage and all that type of stuff. Uh, I, I think I may end up in the same position as him, but I'd do it for 50 IQ technical factors where it's like, oh, well, if it's below 1.1K, that's about the, the best bullish setup you could hope for, right? Like the orderly retest, as you said, and all the bullish market structure and closing of our previous month's low and so on and so forth. Like if that's not the low, then goodbye to towards your levels. So, so I don't know if I fully, I'm not intelligent enough to meaningfully agree or disagree from a kind of uh, market structure and yield point of view, but purely technically, I, I can see the ramifications of if it does turn out to be uh, lag as opposed to lead. That's going to be very ugly because then we have to revert to the base case of ETH overcorrecting in a bear market correction. And then we have to target something, uh, you know, deeper than Bitcoin. And that gets to pretty wonky price levels. Uh, yeah, I I honestly, like, whenever I hear this kind of stuff, like, oh, there's hidden leverage, whatever. I mean, it's going to be true in any point during any market cycle, really. Like, you're going to have, like, stuff rely <laughs> rely on price. And this is just how this market works. So you're going to find that at the bottom, at the, like, at the bottom of the bear market, in the middle of the bear market, at the top of the bear market, as in, like, during the bull. Um and what I oftentimes kind of see is that people try to use these kind of arguments to like just not buy. Um, we saw the same with Solana when it was at range low. Obviously, Solana, as an example, kind of sucks because it eventually broke down. 
But if you remember when I bought Solana at like 20, 27 or something um, back in, in June. Hey, it's half off, Don. I'm just saying, if you liked it at 27, <laughs> you'll love it at 14. <laughs> oh, it's a little bit of a different picture now. Yeah, yeah, when yeah. I, when I bought it back then, right, I, I, everyone, like, I had so many people be like, hey, there's an on-chain liquidation, like, just a few dollars below. Um, you're going to get wrecked. And then it doubled, right? Or almost doubled. And um, I think, like, you can, you can use that stuff. But you can always, there's always going to be liquidation. There's always going to be hidden leverages. Always, at any price point, there's always going to be a plenty of all of that. So it's basically just, at least as I see it, it's a way to justify your bias, which, fair enough, but I don't necessarily subscribe to it too much. So it's just basically, if you already know where you want the market to go and you just kind of look for this data, you'll find plenty during any point. Um, it's just kind of my opinion, so... I don't really use it too much. Um, obviously, interesting when you have like a bunch of uh, like a bunch of uh, positive funding during a ma massive bear market, right? That's one thing. But the the hidden leverage, I don't know, seems a little bit far fetched. But then again, like like you, I'm I'm a 50 IQ kind of guy. I just <laughs> buy the support and sell higher up. And if I see relative weakness, I sell. If I see relative strength, I buy. It's just kind of this this. 50 IQ thing that's been keeping me safe during the bear markets and keeps on like, I mean, it's been working quite well. So I, I don't really see why I would want to change the recipe. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Too much. I think it's, your views would converge and you'd end up in the same place if the technicals aligned, right? Like, yeah. you know, if one at 1K, 1.1K didn't end up being the bottom and you saw kind of acceptance below the range low, uh, whether it be for hidden leverage reasons or, hey, the market looks shit for, for whatever other reasons, you end up in the same at the same conclusion regardless. Yeah. Uh, so, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, as far I mean, that's the monthly breakdown. We could take a quick peek at the S and P actually before we jump into uh, lower time frame crypto. Lower time frame for yeah. us, meaning weekly and daily, of course. Um, the story in the S and P. The, the reason we initially got bullish this thing, uh, to little avail, given crypto imploded, but it's it's still nice. <laughs> was mm -hmm. the monthly time frame reclaim of the thirty seven hundred handle? Right, we've sort of gone on about this for ages. It was the first sign of a failed uh, breakdown in the market. I mean, that's like textbook the way the market yeah. reacted around those levels. You, you couldn't ask for anything better, you know? Like it engulfs back into the range the month after the breakdown. Then you get the wick perfect retest. I mean, look at the close, right? That That's some crazy yeah. stuff. That's like a fantastic trade and crypto is easily at range highs. Um, should we, you know, if, if we didn't implode. I, I always think it's always cautious to employ that logic because my brain immediately goes to the joke where if, like, if my auntie had bollocks, she'd be my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well, yes, it's like yeah, but crypto did implode. So like you know, what use is that argument? Which which is fair enough. Um, I, I'm wondering if you have any kind of relevant market levels on the monthly time frame for the S and P, given it like the support's really done its job, right? Like the failed yeah. breakdown setup seems to have uh, played out, or at least there's been like an impulsive move away from it. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any levels closer to the like let's say the last high on a candle body basis is like what around 4100 4130 yeah. the top of the last green candle uh, do you see that as resistance and if not um how how high do you expect the market to go off the back of this monthly reclaim i i like 4.3k um so a little bit higher but i do see 4.1 as a little bit of a resistance uh in in the way of that but honestly it just looks good to me it was uh, we talked about this monthly close when when it reclaimed, right? And then it retested. We we're talking about it nonstop, basically. Oh yeah, this is the retest. Um, and then it just giga mooned, right? And uh, honestly, this is the first time that technicals, like bearish technicals, have failed um, to produce anything. So I would take it serious. I can take see this like go quite a bit further. Um, I wouldn't want to step in front of it. It gets much much more interesting for me. Um, at 4.3k. Saddest part about all of this is that um, we've kind of used up a lot of the S&P potential, uh, I like to call it, um, as in like the S&P dropped a lot from the highs and you kind of know that it's going to at least, even if it's bearish, have like some sort of relief bounce. And we kind of wasted all of that potential because, um, because of the whole FTX saga. Um, so... We're in this shitty situation where I could see this go up another, like, whatever, 5 to 10%. And that would be normally would be really, really nice for crypto markets as well. It's just like a little bit of a tailwind. 
but given given that we are sunk in the the swamp of whatever this shit is <laughs> the swamp of SBF um, yeah <laughs> uh, yeah the swamp of SBF uh, it, it's been it's been lackluster right yes. but i still think there's a little bit of of potential left um which i think could lead to a crypto squeeze which would be nice um but i i'll i'll um i'll wait and see but i wouldn't want to be bearish to SBF. i don't really see a reason to uh, it's it's a strong it's a strong breakdown that didn't materialize anything and then actually just reclaimed very, very strong. So, I mean, just give it some room, I think. Is this still is this thing still in the downtrend? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. I think it'll be the downtrend even at 4.3k. Yeah, so that's why you like 4.3k, right? It's the point of utmost lower highness, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like if you're going to get a lower high anywhere that makes sense and squeezes from a market structure point of view, kind of has to be at around 4,300 because then you start yeah. getting into dodgy territory if that if it doesn't turn there. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's pretty reasonable. It, you could also see that on the weekly quite clearly. Like in terms of the big swings, you know, that 4280 handle, that that's sort of where a lot of stuff starts to come together. Uh, but I agree, it's a real shame that we lost out on crypto strength given... You know, we used we used the S and P energy to basically survive, or at least not go much lower. So you know, if this thing resumes trend, that would be rough, I think. So uh, we'll have to see. We will talk about macro very briefly. We had non farm payrolls today, um, but yeah, that definitely seems like the the name of the game. Uh, dollar stuff um, that that seems pretty breakdowny, to be honest. Uh, you'll recall on the shows, like on on weekly open, for example, maybe even here, I was talking about a potential weekly support at the point of like the origin of the pump at around 105 106 uh, and that got smoked basically uh th that ate shit completely and it had and it's now pulling back into what looks like much deeper levels of monthly structure uh, i'm not sure if it's at your it looks like it's breaking your quarterly little box as well mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't mean that to sound so condescending sorry <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? you know your little box babe your little box it's broken <laughs> fuck your little box it's not my fault <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's not that wasn't my intention whatsoever um but but the uh, quarterly structure looks cooked. Uh, the weekly structure also looks cooked. And it looks like we're going to go at least towards what? Like 103, 102, 103, mm -hmm. which is the, you know, the, the monthly consolidation before the last like quarterly move. Uh, and it also seems to line up with some previous highs and lows as well. Uh, so that seems like a um, decent target for dollar, right? Like if, if, yeah. if, if, if it's going to be bullish anywhere, it looks like the weekly and the quarterly areas just weren't good enough. And we're going to get a good old fashioned uh, rounded retest of the um, 102, 103 handle. So again, this is the type of stuff you'd ordinarily want to see for risk assets to do well. Um, you know, S&P, uh, well, dollar weakness and then the way the effect that has on uh, risk indices and uh, crypto and so on and so forth so so it's lining up very well from a macro point of view uh, it's just crypto flows are themselves so kind of dominant at the moment which is something we were asking for but not in this way <laughs> uh, it looks like um yeah so what what do you think 101 102 103 ish is just like will put more pressure on us given given the type of support that it is yeah i think 102 is a nice level like if i want to trade this i'd want to buy 102 and then hope that uh, the quarterly is actually going to just uh, close back above support, which I could honestly see. So it's going to be an interesting month, I think. Like end of year is always interesting. Um, and uh, December historically has been quite well, like has been quite good in uh, for, for crypto. Um, yeah. I've like some of my best trades have been in December, which I mean, I would like to repeat again. Um, we've seen a lot of big, big moves on ETH, on all coins in general, uh, during the during the winter time, during the December kind of. Oh yeah, everyone's Christmas trading basically. I hope that we get that again. Be kind of nice, but yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm, my my expectations on on this whole thing, on this whole dollar weakness, is quite muted mm -hmm. because I think it's quite extended. I mean, this is a huge move now. Um, it's down eight, almost nine percent off the top. It's almost engulfed the last uh, uh, quarterly candle. Yes. So I wouldn't expect much, much more, honestly, before it goes, before it goes sideways. So one or two makes sense to me. It's not too far off. Anything beyond that starts getting like a little bit too aggressive. I don't really see the reason why 
why we'd go that far at least this quickly. Yeah, that seems right. So, I mean, the macro stage is set, pretty much. You just need yeah. someone to lift some asks, for God's sake. Uh, speaking of which, if we go on to slightly lower time frames, let's say the weekly time frame for, for mm -hmm. BTC, um, has that evolved in any meaningful... I mean, it's it's curling up, to use a phrase that I don't like whatsoever, uh, on the weekly time frame, where you've got some some semblance of a swing low type of structure. Uh, and, you know, if it, especially if it accelerates through... So you know the big breakdown week we had, right? The huge weekly candle. And then we had this yes. in tiny red candle week after that. Uh, we've currently poked above the high of that inside week, uh, which is like a lower time frame range high as well. I kind of want to see that not act as resistance uh, if the expectation is for more upside, because then it just looks mm -hmm. like a classic range thing, right? That the market poked below uh, the extreme low and didn't go anywhere, and now it's going to poke above the extreme high of the consolidation. And if it doesn't go anywhere there, I'm not going to expect like a larger reversion towards 19k. It just it'll just mm -hmm. look kind of trapped within the weekly range. So ideally, I don't want to see too much resistance there if I want a shot at trading around that sort of 18, 19 handle. That that's kind of the weekly view, and you know the daily time frame. Uh, more or less supports that. I mean, it's, look, on, in the newsletter, we focused on something which I think it made sense to focus on, which is that, hey, we've got a failed breakdown for the first time on some sort of time frame ever, right? <laughs> and that was yeah. the kind of 15.8K range low where the market closed below it, closed above, pulled back, obviously didn't feel any of my buys at the actual level itself, because why would it, right? That would almost be reasonable, so I had no business doing so. Uh, and then, uh, it looked, I mean, on the daily time frame, depending on what swing high, swing low you use, this is like a market structure break, right? Like it's some yes. sort of higher high depending on you know even if, even if you look at a line chart you know these some of these swing points are maybe are deep enough to qualify as higher highs depending on your perspective um so we've got like a failed breakdown for the first time it's moved up through the range midpoint having found resistance there originally right that's kind of the last time we spoke this is where the market was it was it was stuck uh testing the range midpoint which which is always like a nuisance when you're trading in a range but then we had a very strong day through it and now a two-day pullback um, to, to retest that range midpoint uh, and, and that sort of at the moment looks like it's support whether you want to use the three-day kind of mini candle consolidation before the breakdown or just the 16.7k level itself uh, it seems like stuff is developing positively at least within the context of this range we have failed breakdown resistance at midpoint breakout of midpoint and now retest of midpoint as well and actually the only untested structure within this entire range is towards the range high at 17.6 and so on and so forth um, how do you think it like What's your view of how this is developing within the daily range? Uh, and then also, uh, do you like the odds of a sort of 18 to 19K squeeze, retest, or, you know, however you want to term it? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, I have, I, I bought Bitcoin, I bought Litecoin. Um, so I'm, I think the odds are decent, otherwise I wouldn't have. Um, I, in general, like I look at the daily and I think there's a lot of potential there. Now, whether it's going to actually play out or not, that's been been a big question because we've had a few few times during the spare market where we've had a lot of potential and then we had another really really bad news slash black swan event happen um that kind of squashed the potential uh, but i think this time looks pretty good to me on the daily honestly it still feels like um people are very much disbelieving the rally which i get because it, it makes sense to be cautious i guess and it, there's a lot of reasons to be bearish I, because we had FTX blow up. We had like all these fundamental things and um, all like you can make up a lot of stuff why price should go down. And then you can just ignore the chart because the chart looks somewhat decent to me. Right. Um, and whenever that's the case, I think there's potential to squeeze people out because they look at the chart. And or they look at the numbers and they're like, oh, Bitcoin's up 10%, 20%. This is a bear market. Um, shouldn't be this way. I'm just going to short uh, because that's been working really well. And then you can obviously kind of have a little bit of a nice squeeze. So, yeah, I, I think there's a good, there's like the daily looks good to me. Uh, really good, actually, as long as it closes like consistently above 16.9, which we're basically just trading at sure. right now. Um, and especially as long as we don't lose recent lows, right? So I talked about um, not going back to um, 15K when we were trading at 16. Um, now I, I'm going to like we're almost at 17K and I do not want to see a trade back at 16K, which is kind of comfy, right? When you buy um, 
at 16K uh, and then buy a little bit more below. And then it goes back to 16K and you're like, oh, I know exactly where I want to get out of this thing if it yeah. rolls over. And now I have like another point because I really don't want to see it below 16K um, because then I think it's actually just going to roll over, which is one of the more comfy ways to trade, in my opinion, when the market is this extreme. So I basically my, my invalidation on my trades is well into profit now. Um, and I'm just along for the ride, trying to make it as hard as possible. I wouldn't honestly mind giving up all the profits I've made on the trades, just based on the fact that I see a lot of potential. It's it's this question of, do you want to be greedy for the big move or do you just want to trade the kind of like easy one? And I think the easy trade is like mostly done. Now you want to be want to be wondering, okay, do I want to risk it for the big trade, which would be to 19K? Um, because that has in itself a lot of potential again, right? If you look at the daily, sure. that's where the previous range broke down. So if we go back to 19K, um, you have to ask yourself, do you're going to, is this actually going to come back into the previous range or not? And then you have a lot of more potential to go. Obviously, it doesn't have to because that's all resistance, but um yeah so that's i think there's a lot of potential um i think the the daily looks good enough to at least risk all the profits i've made uh, in the last few days so i'm just gonna hold on and um expect prices to go higher but uh, i'm obviously not married to the idea because we've been in the bear market for long enough and the fundamental kind of news that we've been getting has been atrocious and it's probably not gonna stop anytime soon so can we get a Genesis update, for goodness sake? Like, what's going on there? That's so crazy to me, this whole DCG Genesis structure. And yes. it's it's been radio silence for a week. Um, that's mad. So in terms of this setup, you know, Don, if you keep moving up, you'll stop $1,000 every single week. By sort of next year, we'll be at all-time high. So that's <laughs> a, just, keep, just keep doing that for us, would you? Um, uh, do you see any resistance before... So, so like, invalidation-wise, basically any loss of momentum, you're like, fuck this thing, right? Sort of back below yes. 16, and if there's, like, the big green daily candle, if that starts getting threatened, it probably doesn't look how you want it to look at that point, exactly. right? Yes. That's fine. Uh, do you see any resistance before 19K? So, obviously, within the range that I mapped out, this kind of 17.6, you know, the, the close of the big green candle post-nuke, uh, that, that's kind of the equivalent range-low structure, right? So, the range-low is the lowest close in the range, and that was, like, where the failed breakdown took place. Are you going to at least be, like keep an eye on 17.6 to be like hey you know sometimes the market likes to mirror so if tried to break down from 16 didn't go anywhere and then maybe it tries to break out from 17.6 and doesn't go anywhere is, is that on your radar at all or is it more of a mm -hmm. listen my entry is so good send me to fucking 19 or uh, go away basically yeah i mean yeah, i i see it i think it makes for like a smart trader that only takes like the the good trades basically it makes a lot of sense for me uh to kind of take an exit there or take like profits. Um, but honestly, for me, I don't really see the point. I want to have, I want to, I see, I see more in this trade than just 17.6K. I don't want to just make a 10% trade. Um, if we go back and reclaim 19K, I could see us like go up for a couple of months and I don't want to just take the exit of like a really, really good um, entry just because we're hitting lower time frame um, resistance. Obviously, could come back and bite me in the ass, but I think with this kind of setup, you just want to be betting on some sort of midterm low to be in. Uh, would make sense given, like, if if you move up from here in at the midst all this kind of panic and terror that we've had in the market, uh, it would make sense that this would hold for a while. So I don't want to get rid of the position if I don't have to, which means basically I'm not going to take any profit until prices look much, much better or until we lose momentum and starts looking really shit, which just means I'm going to give back a lot of profit or I'm going to make a shitload of money. Uh, one or the other, I don't want to have like any like five or 10% business here. Um, besides like on, for example, me trading Litecoin, I'm down to just trade it around 10% here and there. I've done that a couple of times now, um, but I'm very much not down to kind of gamble a good entry on like a lower time frame resistance given the state of the market right now sure yeah um i mean there is definitely a roadmap for this thing 
stopping looking like garbage, right? You break out of 17.6, you get into the 19k bearish retest, it fails, it squeezes, yada yada. There's a whole world in which that unfolds quite favorably that, that's worth yeah. being aware of. And I guess you just want exposure to that scenario given you've got comfy entry. So that makes total sense. Um, yeah. On the ETH front, this this has always been a bit wonky you know i'm not gonna we talked about the monthly i'm not gonna revisit the whole discussion of is is the you know is this higher low uh la lagging or leading i think you just have to look at it as a higher low for the time being because that's sort of what's in front of you and what's available um to me this range at the very least is slightly less clear than than for btc in terms of the like the, the specifically the lower time frame stuff um I, i'm wondering if first of all you still care about the the weekly underside structure that we wrote about in technical roundup you know the lowest close of the kind of mini consolidation at third you know 1270 or thereabouts and then you know if you if you sort of transplant that onto the daily time frame uh, i talked about bitcoin's highest close and lowest close after the nuke uh, eth also tagged actually its highest close kind of range high equivalent at 1299 or the 1300 handle uh, while also kind of retesting this weekly level of weekly level of resistance like what, what do you see on eth and it's actually what it, oddly enough it's one of the ones you didn't buy right as part of your uh purchasing sprees i'm wondering if there's a particular reason for that like for me imme immediate eye test wise this is like at resistance um but like given the divergent structure and it's not like the best best weekly kind of level in the world i'm wondering if like what would give you strong views here yeah i mean it looks just good to me honestly um it is obviously at weekly resistance um and if we close like we're currently looking um i could see next month be a little bit of like a a week to the downside, maybe back to 1.2k. Um, but I, I honestly, I'm surprised that this low is holding. Uh, as I think are uh, you and as a lot of other people as well. Um, just this kind of like higher low thing on the weekly just is quite odd given given the news and given how Bitcoin looks, especially. Um, so honestly, if, if I. ETH just looks really good above 1.3k. Like it, the moment it starts closing above 1.3k on the weekly, it starts looking really strong. And then I, I told you earlier um, that I would like it to kind of close above 1.5k on the monthly, which is kind of, it's a nice setup, right? When you have a weekly that looks really good above 1.3k, which you then can roll into a, week, uh, a monthly that looks really good above 1.5k. So basically you want to buy ETH above 1.3k on the weekly, um, and that would probably have some momentum towards 1.5k, uh, and that could end the month really nice. Um, so it, it's not, it's not a bad um, setup. It's at resistance though, and it's not entirely clear to me um, how that's gonna go. But I, I actually like it a lot. Um, I think it's been stronger than I expected it to, uh, especially the last two weeks. Um, it's already pushing back on the on the BTC pair. It's already pushing back into resistance, which it's visited like a billion times. So um, maybe that'll go. That'd be interesting because then you'd actually get a really, really uh, aggressive ETH rally, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I actually don't hate it too much. Um, it's just at resistance, which makes it difficult. But also like on the ETH USD pair again, um, on the daily time frame, we had this range right back in June to to <clears throat> excuse me to July, um, and uh, we broke below that after using it as support a couple of times, and now we're back above it, um, which is really interesting because on on the Bitcoin daily you haven't really done any reclaiming of sorts uh, on ETH uh, we have, which uh, makes makes this really interesting as well. So honestly, ETH just looks good-ish, but I'm saying that while it's at resistance. So you want to see at least one more week of strength and then um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, put some funds there too. Um, I'm definitely not a hater of, of an EVE position. Um, <laughs> just I, I want to be patient a little bit longer sure. on this front. Yeah, I think that makes them, that's pretty consistent. Um, I'm really curious to see how this uh, higher low divergence resolves. There's easily a world in which 
in hindsight, it, it looks quote unquote obvious, like it always does, right? Like, oh, yeah. look, ETH BTC was retesting resistance a million times, and ETH USD didn't make a lower low. And then, as soon as the market kind of breathed a bit of relief, this thing just ripped up, and there was no monthly resistance. You know, you can start to build it up in your head. And I don't think it's like the dumbest argument in the world. Uh, I, I probably just need to see a bit more evidence of it, but it, it's definitely on my radar. And I'm still like in short term trading mode. Uh, but the, the thing is, we talked about bearish catalysts. If you want one, there's that. I'm three for three on my short term trades. Usually the next one wipes out my account and the market. So, <laughs> so, so just be, you've been warned. You've been fairly warned. Um, let's cover Litecoin really quickly because you're still in this trade, uh, presumably. Um, yes. We've actually been trading around each other in this thing, just hilarious. Like when you closed some of your longs around the same time I was short and then my short closed and you rebought it's like this <laughs> it's like this uh human caterpillar or whatever it's called human centipede just mm -hmm. a, a very uh, unflattering mental image um but the setup here as far as i'm aware is that hey this weekly breakout is gonna like do things right after a long consolidation uh and then on the daily time frame it's it, i mean look to me this thing is a bit like rangy at the moment but it's rangy after uh, after a big breakout which is like okay like i would have preferred if it just teleported to be honest on a breakout mm -hmm. of this magnitude uh, but it hasn't exactly rolled over and bartered either so i've just kind of been trading the higher time frame levels in and out like well took one punt specifically uh, but i'm just wondering what's kind of got you interested in uh staying in this trade and also your invalidation is presumably what like some sort of loss of momentum because i think the levels are pretty clear um you yeah. sort of said uh, the one, basically the 100 to 120 ish um, pre breakout cluster is like a good target for a break that breakout of this magnitude. Uh, but I'm wondering yeah. if the last since we last spoke about Litecoin, whether anything has changed really. Yeah, I mean Litecoin has a really good monthly close now. Um, if you just go on Litecoin USD monthly, um, it basically broke a sixty dollar resistance and. Um, and the next resistance on the monthly is 120, which is a double from that resistance. It's also 60 is basically my entry. I managed to make it a little bit better given I've traded the position. Um, but to me, anyway, this is a high time frame breakout, right? On, like I said, on the monthly, and then you have a good resistance, a double away. It just kind of makes sense to trade, even if this pulls back a little, like if it goes to 70 from here on, um, that's still in the area of support for me. And I'm willing to kind of see it go to 120. And then if the market has turned around, like it depends, right? If we just, if Litecoin just went here um, and completely broke out without anyone else in the market doing so, as in Bitcoin is still trading below 20K, um, then I take profit at 120, right? Because then it would feel like it, it's just, I think that'd be too much. Um, like you cannot have it all on, on Litecoin. But if it's, if it's uh, basically on the back of Bitcoin breaking back above 20K and we go to 120 on Litecoin, I'd want to keep that um, because I'd think then you'd have more, more, more potential in this trade. So uh, it's, the same, it's the same as I see in Bitcoin, just with added tailwind because Litecoin Bitcoin has been amazing. And the high time frame actually looks on Litecoin looks better than it does on Bitcoin because it's basically... If you zoom out on this thing, um, it's basically made a high back in 2018. Um, it's made a low in that bear market. And ever since then, it's not broken that low. And it's actually made a higher high and uh, now in the process of doing a higher low. Obviously, much more swingy and uh, the, the last uh, old season of sorts has been more than disappointing. Um, but I still like this. I like this chart. I think we could... Uh, go back quite a quite a bit, honestly. Like to 220, I think doesn't seem too re unreasonable given given the scope of this breakout. But I want to see it develop first, obviously, and I want to see how Bitcoin acts. If Bitcoin breaks down, this isn't gonna be spared. Uh, it's basically just I I'm betting on Bitcoin not breaking down, and I'm betting on the Litecoin Bitcoin tailwind, which has been really strong to continue. So um, not really interested in in um in taking early profits either it's the same same kind of thing i'm willing to cut this if it lo loses all momentum as in like it goes back below 60 i'm down to just be like okay maybe i was wrong on this um but if it doesn't um i'll keep it until at least 100 120 
um, just to see whether uh, Bitcoin actually can catch a bit. If it can, I think I'm going to keep it even at that point and try to aim for the next high time frame resistance, which is 220, which seems crazy to most people I know. Um, but given we're trading high time frame here and um, given this is basically a level uh, that we hit every like two, three, four years, um, uh, it just kind of makes sense to me. I like sometimes you have this potential uh, because you're at high time frame levels where you just don't want to give up on positions and we're in that right now. So down to hold. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I think like we've had a lot of comments which are understandably kind of raising eyebrows at your targets. But, we, but we've sort of covered it before. Um, at a certain point, if you're interested in large swings, you have to take those large swings at high time frame levels. And if you treat every single high time frame level as a trading level, then you'll never really fully be exposed to the high time frame swing that you wanted in the first place. Uh, and I also understand the critique people have, though, we can take profit and then you can re-enter and do all that type of stuff. But that's, that's not for everyone, you know? That whole, like, very dynamic trade management, opening, closing, re-entering, it's, it, it's a very specific, actually, type of style. Uh, just like, you know, for example, I'm a terrible momentum continuation trader, but I can buy stuff really well when it's distressed or at an extreme, right? Kind of fading big moves. So it's like, oh, Craig, why don't you just buy confirmation or sell confirmation? It's like, as I said last week, I can't. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to make other choices. So yeah, there's definitely some interesting discussions to be had there. Um, but I, I think that the reasoning makes sense. Are you still, is there an XRP development that's worth talking about? Um, or is it um... more or less the same? I mean, it's the same setup, um, but I like it less. So I sure. actually, like I sold, I, I was pretty sure we were going to see a, a quite a big uh, dump on Monday. So I took uh, took profits basically before because I was like, okay, this, I'd be stupid not to if I can see this, like if I can see Bitcoin dump on Monday. It did dump on Monday and it took all the old coins with it basically. Um, and I sold, I sold before. Um, um, and I was looking to rebuy during the course of the week. And uh, the Mon Monday dump actually just basically took Litecoin quite low. Uh, so I, I was able to to basically buy back what I sold for 10% for cheaper. And uh, while I was doing that, I was kind of contemplating whether I would want to buy like the same position that I had in XRP instead again. Um, but I just decided to just add it on to Litecoin trade as in just took the XRP trade, sure. um, merged it with the Litecoin trade to make it. Um, so I have to kind of watch one one less narrative, one less chart. Um, obviously makes trading it a little bit more difficult because uh, the position is bigger and um, like it's an old coin, so liquidity isn't as good as you would like it um, to be. But yeah, um, basically added the XRP to the Litecoin trade. and. The reason for that is that I like that I like the Litecoin trade better. It makes more uh, makes more sense to me. Uh, but I'm more than willing, and this is kind of how I trade these things. Like if Litecoin goes crazy here, um, without other participants, I'm willing to kind of take it out of Litecoin and redistribute it elsewhere or trade it around. Um, I'm kind of flexible on that front. So if I see an opportunity, I will take it. Um, it's not like I'm married to any of these positions. I mean, I'm still disappointed that you didn't bid 69 and you just bottomed it at 70. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, man? At least you have the meme uh, yeah. confluence there. That that was very disrespectful, but it's fine. Yeah, but I mean, imagine trying, imagine bidding 69 and then not getting filled. That's just disappointing. I hate when I don't get filled on 69. Same, bro. Right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, I think that does it. I think for the most part, that's the majors covered mm. um to jump into some headlines and obviously thank you to everyone who supports casual friday and watches us like the video subscribe all that stuff leave us a comment we do read all of those or at least i do god knows what don does day to day uh <laughs> in any case <laughs> we have news headlines i've got four um and only two of them are sbf related so that's that's a win Ooh. right that's like a 50 in the, in these markets um also, I will just start, I don't know, were you following the Twitter space that he joined? Um, oh, no, I haven't had time. Yeah, so he, he joined the Twitter space hosted by a certain gentleman, and, and they had a panel on um, to ask him questions. And it was the biggest waste of time I've ever been privy to. And the quality of questioning was just so pathetic and so embarrassing and so self-indulgent that they managed to make Sam look good. 
because he was running oh, circles no. around them. Um, and to, to me, that was just like such a way... Like, the issue is, again, as we've said before, people have taken this tragedy and have used it to, like, amplify their own voices and farm clout and farm engagement to, like, obscene levels. But now it's gotten to a point where you always have to weigh up, like, what is the public interest in getting this thing correct versus how can I serve myself with this type of event to, uh, you know, further my own position in the industry. And it seems like, in, in my view, a lot of people have got that balance completely fucking wrong. So they had the opportunity to ask Sam, like, difficult questions in, like, a live Twitter space setting. And it was, you know, there were, like, six people on the stage all interrupting each other. No one had done their research and asking, like, really basic stuff and really poor understanding of exchanges. And the sad part is you had people like Jesse Powell, who's a fucking exchange CEO who, like, knows it. He's, like, refuting what Sam is saying in real time. But instead of bringing him up or having him as one of the speakers, it's just all these, like, self-serving influencers um, taking advantage of the massive numbers that joined the join the space because Sam was there. Um, embarrassing, and, and I think a great disservice to the so-called citizen journalism, which um, you know, which, which kind of had a decent redemption arc earlier on. I mean, Sam in, in vocally sort of said he'll try to come up up only, and also do the, the Scoop podcast with Larry and Frank from the block, so that would be good. Um, but this most recent showing was, like, look, yeah, it was just very disappointing. And it's just so annoying to see people like leverage this type of event exclusively or like 90% not for the public good but f for themselves and it's just you know it just becomes really obvious when someone hasn't done their homework and don't have like the technical chops or expertise to ask the right questions it ends up being uh, a waste of everyone's time and actually gives Sam an avenue of redemption because he's fucking running circles around these fools and it was I wasn't too happy and if you go back and read Twitter on that evening I, I think that was uh, the consensus view among among many of us yeah, I mean it's the most the, the, it 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 seems like what's the the Russian doll, um, Matryoshka. Matryoshka, yeah, yeah, Matryoshka, yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, how this this whole thing is playing out, right? It's just this, like you you look into something, um, like let's say you're an outsider and you're reading like or you watching the space or um or the spaces as in on Twitter, or you're reading news um on Twitter or anywhere else. This is kind of the, the Matryoshka of, of scams, right? Basically, like, Sam's the, the obvious, like, that was, like, beyond <laughs> borderline scam. And then you're like, oh, who, who wrote this? And then you look at it, and then, like, there's a scammer too, right? And then you go down the list, and it just keeps on, like, more and more scammers keep on popping up left and right. And you're like, what the fuck? And it's it's a bad, bad look on, on this whole space, right? Because, like, it, I mean, most of... The people I saw the list of people that took part in that, um, and mm. I'm honestly appalled. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just like it's all grifters, almost all grifters, um, just trying to take advantage of the situation, like you said. But yeah, and then you you kind of wonder, okay, um, who's actually just not in this space to just like take advantage of other people? It's fucking right. sad. At this point, Never let right? a good crisis go to waste, right? When it comes to oh yeah. It, it's horrendous. And these people should be ashamed of themselves, but the insane thing is they don't actually realize um, what kind of leeches they are. Oh, it's, they do, um, and it's a very conscious trade-off, right? Like, oh, I don't really exactly know about this whole how to ask the right questions and procedural propriety and so on, but look at my fucking Twitter followers and look at how popular these videos and spaces are. So, you know, why, why would they via course? Because that, that, that's like future bull market profits, right? These types of high engagement whatever metrics but yeah it was a like at a certain point you have to put the public interest first i think and if you don't do it then then you <laughs> you'll probably never do it so so yeah, yeah i mean just again shows the types of people that rise to the top like if you look at the past two months the people that have been made heroes out of this or have you know been the sort of vigilante justice types i, I personally they wouldn't be top of my list for representing the industry uh but they're the oh. they're the ones willing to capitalize on it and be a bit machiavellian about it in my personal opinion so and you know as we know that gets rewarded in crypto which is sad um yeah i think honestly whenever you have any anyone that's trying to put themselves in the middle of the discussion um on something like this, right? Like people get hurt, people, whatever. And then they're just like trying to like, just be like, oh yeah, I'm the hero in this, in this story. Uh, in crypto, especially, it's mostly just people that take advantage of the people that were hurt, right? It's not yes. necessarily like they're trying to do something good. Most of the time, it's just um, 
it's whitewashing own, right so that there's also this thing yeah. right where people who may have not acted with utmost again propriety at a certain point in the market um they then get an opportunity for what they perceive as redemption and they'll go on t- t- to do these seemingly selfless endeavors and media puff pieces and charity this that and the other whereas in in reality that that does nothing realistically to mitigate their past actions but 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 it's sort of you know with the passage of time and you do all these good deeds and you kind of lay on the down low the idea is you kind of get to um absolve your sins so to speak only to run it back again next time around it, it, it's all a very very cynical practice um but you know whatever Fuck him. <laughs> the, <laughs> Fuck him. The news article here is that the representative Maxine Waters said that Sam Mackman fried should bring candid FTX discussions to Congress. So she was one of the ones who was taking pictures with him and shit, and she's pretty senior up in D.C. Um, and so they've invited him to Capitol Hill to to give uh, to the committee hearing on December the 13th. And she actually sent out a kind of joint tweet um, to this effect, which said, where is it? SBF FTX, we appreciate that you've been candid in your discussions about what happened at FTX. Your willingness to talk to the public will help the company's customers, investors, and others. To that end, we welcome your participation in our hearing on the 13th. Jesus <laughs> Christ. I, 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 I'm out of things to say, to be honest. Uh, like, you know, Really? <laughs> I mean, look, if I had to think about this sort of on intellectual grounds, I'd say a few things. First is, like, she was publicly associated and affiliated with um, SBF himself, right? So maybe she doesn't want to throw him under the bus unless she really, really has to, because it makes her look really bad that she'd endorsed the scammer or whatever, right? So then it becomes yeah. in her self-interest, in her self-interest, which is important, to for the narrative that, oh, this is just like this whiz kid who made a few mistakes and the company was so big, oh, boo-hoo, he got caught off guard, he's so sorry, he's gonna try to help investors. It's in her interest that someone who she's publicly associated with has this, like, path to redemption or something that isn't criminal or malicious or malevolent or whatever else. Um, that's really the only reason I can think uh, of this, uh, you know, for this approach. But on its face, it's obviously a fucking insult, right? This is like, this yeah. is just, uh, frankly, massively bizarre. Um, and, you know, early on when I saw these media puff pieces, my initial reaction was like, surely people won't believe this, right? Like, you listen to anyone who remotely knows anything about crypto who was involved in the space, and like, this is just like blatantly just fucking stealing money, misappropriating funds, co-mingling. This is just like, a, a dis- there's like a disgusting appearance of a criminal element to it or like intent it's not it's not negligence or ignorance that there's like an intentional act here which blew up right to, like to yeah. anyone who like remotely cares but now, and so i thought when these media puff pieces were coming out like oh caroline ellison complex shadow pandemic prevention fucking wonder kid ftx but i'm like okay now nah, this this won't stick because I, th- I thought the intentionality of the actions was so overridingly obvious and in bad faith that no reasonable person could entertain the whole oh he's just an innocent kid who got caught up type of argument boy was i wrong because that is fucking (laughs) spreading like wildfire now this whole like sbf sympathy arc where he just looks down into the ground the meth goblin that he is saying i'm sorry i should have been doing more (laughs) risk management all this type of stuff like people are buying it and it's terrifying and so there's a world and that's what he's leaning into right the fact that he just wasn't experienced enough and you know there's no like um malice there or intentionality like he's really leaning into it in all of his interviews in all of his comments how he how he carries himself and it seems to be working it seems to be working for like the media stuff he does and it seems to be working for regulators if you talk to normies about it a lot of them will kind of subscribe to that argument it, it's absolute like i'm being gaslit in real time you know this is like gaslighting of the highest order and the final thing i'll say is punk 6529 had this really nice tweet where he talked about gel man amnesia and he says, you know, you see how clueless most articles about crypto are. They are like that for everything else you read. It is just that you are not knowledgeable enough on the other subjects to notice, which is like a really good way of thinking about it, right? It's like when we read crypto media as people who get crypto, we're like, hey, what the fuck is this? This is like complete dog shit. But then we'll read something on geopolitics or energy policy or the economy and think, oh, yeah, this is, you know, good information because it's coming from like a certain source or whatever. So I think that's a bias worth being aware of. But I'm just like rambling at this point because I'm, I'm starting to see how he gets away with it. And, and, yeah. and I, I fucking hate it. And yeah, Jesus, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, basically exactly what you said. I, I, I can't really add anything to it. It's terrifying. It's honestly sad. Just shows how, like either how shitty journalism is nowadays and how they just, I don't know, like how they don't really give a fuck 
or how easy it is to buy them. And both of them, I really don't want to have um, because you don't want to have people like you don't want to be able to buy um, the opinion of people and you don't want to have um, shitty reporting influence the, the opinion of people either. It's terrifying, honestly. And I'm, I'm in this case, it seems so clear cut that I actually have no idea how this is happening. Like it's such an obvious just misrepresentation of the whole thing that I, I just don't understand how it's possible. Like I, I'm just same as you. I'm out. I, I, I don't know what to say uh, beyond just that this is dog shit and should not be happening. Uh, the saddest part is that instead of kind of the industry, and this is to the point that we talked about earlier, instead of the industry standing up and getting like, you get like smart people um, to give a voice to, to kind of just roast the fuck out of him in the public forum, you get these people that have like ADIQ influencer status. And those are the ones that talk with him and he's obviously smarter than them. Um, and on top of that, they don't even like look much better than he does. Um, so yeah, it's kind of it's kind of shit situation all around. Um, I hope it's so bad. I I just hope he just kind of talks himself into a grave um, on on these issues in Minecraft. In Minecraft, obviously, <laughs> I don't want him to die because I I don't think anyone should be should be hoping for anyone else to die. But um, I I hope it gets cleared up anyway, and uh, that justice is gonna be dealt because if it's not. It's going to be another disappointment in a long list of disappointments that I've had to go through while I've been in crypto. So I'm starting to think he might get away with it. Like the way it, the, the way it looks right now, it doesn't, I don't know. I, I, I'm skeptical, even though he obviously shouldn't. But also, can you think about the precedent that it would set in the crypto space? If Sam does this and like doesn't end up serving any serious time, what the next iteration of big builders and your Doquans and your SPFs, oh, how, could... how, how emboldened those guys are going to be. It's going it's to be a, like, I, oh my God. Uh, I can already see Justin Sun become the biggest donor to <laughs> political <laughs> parties in, in the US. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, so that's, that's, there's president. that story. Um, it's just yeah. really sad at the end of the day to see as well, because I think the truth is so self-evident in this case, and he's managing to pull the wool over journalists' eyes, uh, legislators' eyes, ATIT, ATIQ influencers' eyes, who through their incompetence are doing his job for him, uh, which is inexcusable. But uh, fuck him, right? That's <laughs> gonna have to keep going back to that in the current state of the market. Uh, in slightly more interesting news, did you see this thing? Apple disables version of Coinbase wallet over NFT gas fees. So Apple has oh, this no, like Apple has this like draconian uh, l rule that they should be able to take a thirty percent cut from any in-app purchases that are made on apps in the mm -hmm. App Store, uh, and they tried to apply that. And, and the reason they wouldn't let um, Coinbase update their uh, wallet is because th there was no way to give them like thirty percent of the gas fee, which is like technologically completely bizarre. So like Apple's this is from Coinbase said Apple's claim is that the gas fees required to send NFTs need to be paid through their in-app purchase system, so that they can collect thirty percent of the gas fee. And then Coinbase said, for anyone who understands how NFTs and blockchains work, this is clearly not possible. And Apple's proprietary in-app purchase system does not support crypto, so we couldn't comply even if we tried. Well, I think we're seeing some pressure come down on like this whole App Store monopoly at this point. Like, you know, Elon was uh, going on about it and how he doesn't like it. Uh, Epic Games, I think that's the Fortnite guys, right? Uh, they were they were complaining about something similar. Now there's this like inherently technologically unreasonable. Um, Coinbase wallet NFT thing going on and um, maybe we see a shift away for, or some sort of I don't know coming to terms with uh, this 30% policy I think if you want to institute that as a company I mean I'm, I'm uncomfortable with monopolies in general but that's kind of a function of modern capitalism so like that sucks and it seems like the antitrust movement died like 50 years ago and doesn't really exist anymore so you know that that's gone out the window um but at a certain point when it becomes like even technologically fe in not feasible to comply even when you want to that that seems a bit a bit ridiculous, right? Yeah, um, it is. So I don't know, maybe in five years, Don, we're all going to be on our Solana phones trading NFTs with each other, but <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem like the near future. No. Uh, it, the, the whole Apple thing is, is fucked up in itself, but uh, I mean, I've been trying not to support Apple too much based on it, um, but at the end, I still have an iPhone, so I mean, it's what it is. Um, 
But we are complicit. <laughs> yeah, people basically have to move away from it, I think, to change something. And it'd be good to change something uh, because it's a fucked up uh, affair when you have like, I mean, 30% is insane. That number is insane. Yeah, it's mad, right? right? And especially if they're like this, this um, kind of hardline with it, it's this usually doesn't end well, right? When 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 there's no um, gray area anymore, or like anything in between, it's just okay. You do this, or uh, usually doesn't end well in my experience. So it'll go, it'll be interesting, I think, uh, down the line when you when you have a uh, few new competitors step in would be nice. I would uh, I would support that kind of movement more than more than I would want. Yeah, maybe to crypto can build Apple something stuff. useful. For a change, right? Oh, absolutely. It's like actually yeah. this whole Web three ecosystem infrastructure, permissionless, decentralized, like you know, if that, if that vision is going to be seen to its full effect, it surely would cross over into the mobile space as well. So something to look out for in the in, in the coming years, perhaps. Uh, final two. One of them is um, Uniswap's own NFT marketplace aggregator live months after Genie acquisition. Um, I think we're reaching a point now where future market participants uh, will at least have a reasonable choice of how much of their crypto speculation do they want to do on-chain versus off-chain. And I still think the uh, kind of off-chain centralized exchanges will be dominant in that regard, purely from a capital efficiency point of view and basic sort of customer support, security, and all that sort of stuff that people like. Uh, but realistically, the, the more features that people use for speculation, like spot trading, uh, you know, we're seeing some DEXs with leverage gain some more traction and market share and being worked on several iterations, prediction markets and now NFT trading as well has always been very on chain. You know, if you, it, we might see a kind of skew and shift towards that, even if it doesn't end up, you know, flipping the centralized providers and being dominant. Uh, I think it's nice that we're building out uh, sufficient infrastructure so people can do a large amount of their business, uh, you know, on chain if they want to, especially after how this year transpired. If you at least have the option of doing so and the skills to be able to self custody and still do most of the things you want to do that that's a pretty good uh crypto future and at least makes it seem less embarrassing that we build all this tech but no one uses it and we all just go into bad versions of tradfi exchanges and, and speculate there so i always like this kind of stuff and you know uniswap definitely changed the game as far as dexes and amm models so seeing them uh, expand into their so so-called on-chain offering and go for nfts as well i think is a move in the right direction that that's cool you know respect mm -hmm, agree agree i mean as, as I mean, the more decentralized we go, the better, um, because we've seen uh, time and time again that the centralized stuff doesn't work. Then again, the decentralized stuff has a lot of, um, lot of challenges to face because it's really hard to use for most people. Like it's, I wouldn't want to send uh, my family members uh, anywhere decentralized because honestly, it's most of the time much too, um, one, not secure enough because it's really easy to click on a link. It's really easy to just not understand how safety works in the space and two, just way too complicated. So there's a lot to be done, but it needs to happen given, given we've been fucked over left and right by everyone. <laughs> everyone that has a little bit more power in the space just turns out to be, to be a villain, which is very, very sad to see every time. Yeah, and the UI UX wallet experience, all of that needs to improve. But hey, get building, yes. you know, if not now, then mm -hmm. when. Uh, this is the last one, and it was just... <laughs> just let me read this headline without any more context. World Economic Forum denies it asked Shiba Inu to work with them on metaverse global policy. <laughs> 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 like, what the fuck? Oh, Can God. you imagine being the World Economic Forum and you're already dealing with like 10,000 people a day being like, Klaus Schwab is like evil and you want us to live in the pod and eat the bugs and CBDC, world control, pandemic, whatever, whatever, all that type of stuff. And then your <laughs> your tiny PR team or whatever then gets an email asking about like Shiba Inu global metaverse policy. Like surely that's the kind of stuff that makes you reassess your life. Like what the fuck am I doing? Um, I, I just thought this was such a classic like scammy crypto headline. Um, and actually, it was the lead developer who took to Twitter to ask the community whether to accept the supposed invite, and it just it just wasn't real in the first place, which is which is amazing. Um, Dogecoin killer, yeah, yeah. So this is just like a very very meme headline. Actually, there's one more I think I want to mention, and this to me was 
uh, we sort of made a point that some some of the more you know some of the actors who struggled this cycle saw the FTX implosion as a way to kind of get back into the public's good graces and good books because now there's a bigger bogeyman and bigger villain to po- uh, point towards. Uh, and one of them, you know, a couple of the three AC guys basically came out, came back, and they're just like active on Twitter and doing all the usual stuff now, right? Um, yes. One of the beefs that has come out as a result is between uh, Nick Carter and Kyle Davies. So Kyle Davies oh, yeah. being the co-founder of 3AC. And there was just a very funny interaction where, you know, Nick was just was just like, hey, guys, like, what, just what the fuck are you doing speaking to the community in general? Just, like, forget these guys. They're sort of bad faith actors, not good for the space, and don't give them any credibility or time, you know? Uh, and then, you know, Kyle has been tweeting quite frantically at Nick, like, asked him to box him first, which is, you know, classic. Like, he turns, apparently he's a YouTube influencer now because that's sort of the level uh, level that we've reached. Um, well, I think Nick might have done that. I could be completely wrong there. Uh, yes, yes, Nick did that. My apologies. Nick was the one saying, oh, we can sort of box it out. I don't want to deal with you like a serious intellectual because you're not. And so that, that Kyle didn't like that. And he sent out this tweet saying, like, um, you know, because BlockFi ate shit, basically. And my understanding is uh, Nick was one of the investors at some point of BlockFi. And then Kyle was using a flex being like, oh, well, you know, I, I, you, I invested in uh, BlockFi as well. But then on the second round, I sold for like a 20X and he's using all this kind of stuff. And someone just very casually replies like, what does it matter when you sold what profits you make if you got zero out anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I just found that to be like super funny and a very appropriate comment to make. Like, I'm sorry, if your P&L curve ends at zero, I don't really care what it looks like in between, right? Or negative yeah. even. So, so, um, yeah, I think that that's also just a very sad part of uh, this FTX implosion is that a lot of people who we thought were gone and who, for, for, for most intents and purposes, have been a form of good riddance. Uh, they've been emboldened by this to um, to come back and try to try to scrape something back. And you know what? I think they'll be successful. I, I'm always I always take an extreme view on this, but my I'm so bearish, like crypto collective memory and, um, you know, the, the, the weight of your reputation the, the the amount of churn, the ease with which people kind of forgive and forget and come back and how new participants don't study their history, whatever, all of these factors, uh, we've seen it in the past, you know, people who've not acted the best, put it that way, are, are sort of welcomed back with open arms, especially if the context is right and the bull market is right, or if they just think they can make money off it. So, you know, all of our social layer uh, filters, if you will, and defense mechanisms are completely useless in my estimation. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of these same faces stick around and become relevant once again uh, next time. I don't and there'll know. be people I like you and me, Don, ranting on podcasts in like one, two, three years, being like, I remember when this guy, you know, and it's like, <laughs> no one will give a shit. Yeah, I, I don't want to live in that world, but uh, we're probably going to live in that world, yeah. It's just how it is. I, it is. It, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've seen it too many times, right? Yes, uh, yes. A lot of the community members that are now like um, all over uh, started out the same way, um, just kind of like fucking other people over. It's just, it's crypto, right? I mean, I'm not going to be hating on the redemption arc, right? When people just try to make, make things right. But there's some things that I think are just too much. Um, where you cannot expect to come back. Uh, and if you come back, you're kind of doing it for bad reasons, right? I don't think like if you if you kind of def- defraud mo- people out of money, you take money from friends uh, to kind of cover your margin uh, to make sure you don't get liquidated uh, and um, tell them that uh, you're completely fine, basically. Uh, and then you get liquidated and people lose money and uh, people that trusted you. Like, I, I don't think that the person that comes back from that uh, to kind of take on Twitter and uh, tweet like how it wasn't their fault, I don't think that's a good reason to come back. Um, you should be kind of re- repenting for what you've done, I guess. Uh, but it doesn't really happen. No, of course um, not. People, people kind of just stick around and in like a year or two, most people will have forgotten. And especially if the prices go back up, it just takes a little bit of bull post posting and then you're in the good books just over it yeah and i i hate it it's one of the things that frustrates me more about that the most about the space but um it's not changed and i mean at this point probably I'd be surprised if it did yeah yeah there's no short-term memory whatsoever and i always found it very cynical when people who concede they've done something wrong even when they do that they make no effort to correct 
or make amends for the wrongs that they, you know, of the past, and they think they can just exclu exclusively focus on the future. Like, that redemption arc has to be a two-part process, right? Where there's, like, a reconciliation for the shit that you did wrong, and then once that's, like, sufficiently cleared up, whatever that means, then you can almost start with a somewhat blank slate, tabula rasa, and then try to build something better from there. And you have to just, like, take all the skepticism and cynicism that comes with that on the chin, because you did... You deserve it. But that doesn't seem to be how people do it in crypto. They'll do something like shitty, they'll leave it, and then they'll just come back and restart without doing any of the yeah, actual, uh, you, know, you know, no contrition there. But, you know, I'm sure we could talk about for two hours the, the weird personality types that rise to the top in crypto. And I think our audience is well aware uh, as far as our views go on that. Um, I think that's it, Duck. Are we, we good to wrap? Yeah, I think, I think it's time. I think it's time. Excellent. Uh, to our audience, thank you to... Thank you for listening to Technical Roundup once again. Casual Friday, always a pleasure to have you. Leave us a comment. Which bit was interesting, which bit wasn't? What are you looking for this week? Uh, thank you for your support throughout this time. Like, subscribe, all the normal YouTube stuff. Also, let us know in the comments if we should start uploading these to like a Spotify or whatever podcast platform. Uh, if there's any, if there's, if there are enough comments there, we'll we'll get on it. But thank you, Duck. Have an excellent weekend, and we'll see all of you next week for our normal uh, programming. Bye bye. Bye bye.